Puffy and the other leaders encamp themselves in Plantation Hollandia. He quickly undertakes the huge task of governing the long stretch of territory along the two rivers. Maintaining freedom in the long term, he realizes, will demand a high level of discipline and organization. He forms a government based on the Dutch system. He appoints himself governor and selects several councillors. These include Akra and Atta, two leaders who are to play major roles in the final outcome of the revolution. An army of 600 fighters is formed and trained. Coffey establishes a military structure similar to the Dutch by appointing lieutenants, ensigns, and privates. In addition, he appoints guards, introduces passwords, and uses spies. Coffey understands that the production of food and sugar must continue. He keeps the basic plantation system and assigns a master for each plantation. Coffey is nonetheless worried that he may not have enough guns and gunpowder to continuously defend the gains of the revolution. Blacksmith workshops are set up to repair and manufacture weapons. But without an external supply of gunpowder and firearms, Coffey's army is limited in its capacity to wage a long war. The initial objective of the uprising is to drive the Dutch off the colony. But now, with this objective within easy reach, Coffey is in a dilemma. He reasons that the revolutionaries may not be able to run the colony without trade and other forms of cooperation with the Europeans. He realizes that his vision of a totally free black colony is impossible in the context of the time. The Dutch and other colonial powers would not allow such a state to exist, fearing it may inspire captive Africans on other colonies to launch their own wars of liberation. For the entire month of March, Coffey does not order any further military attacks against the Dutch. Most historians have since described Coffey's decision as a serious mistake. In the afternoon on March 28, 1763, the English ship Betsy, laden with 100 troops and provisions from Suriname, drops anchor at St. Andrews. The governor of Suriname has responded to Van Hugenheim's desperate call for help. With this large reinforcement, Van Hugenheim immediately plots to retake the colony. He moves inward along the Burbis River with three ships to retake Plantation Dagorad. The return of the Dutch to Dagorad stirs the revolutionaries into action. On April 2nd, Akara, second in command to Coffee, orders 300 men from Plantation Vigilante to attack Dagorad. The revolutionaries fight for many hours, launching several waves of attack with great courage and a total contempt for life. The attacks are however repelled by the fresh Dutch troops from Suriname. Akura's decision to attack Dagorad was taken without the knowledge and agreement of Kofi, who is headquartered at Fort Nassau. Coffee is displeased over the renewal of armed conflict. The next day, he writes the governor to express regret. Coffee, governor of the Negroes of Burbis and Captain Akara, greet your highness. We do not want war. If, however, you are to fight us blacks, we are ready. The governor of Burbis asks you to come and speak to him. In this same letter, Coffee signals his desire for a peaceful coexistence with the Dutch. He proposes that the colony be divided. The lower half for the Dutch and the upper half for the revolutionaries. It's not altogether clear what Coffee's strategy was at the beginning, although he seems to have thought that Van Hogenheim and the Dutch should leave 
the colony entirely. However, clearly sometime after that, he either changed his mind or it was something, the strategy was something which evolved over a period of time. Exactly how it evolved and under what influences, we really don't have enough information at the moment to be able to say. But we do know, for example, that the revolutionaries discussed joining up with the Saramakas in Suriname at one stage, and it may be as a consequence of that that they thought of dividing the colony into two, which somewhat reflected the situation in Suriname, whereby um, the Maroons tended to occupy the upper rivers and the Dutch tended to operate, um, occupy the lower rivers. So that may have been the inspiration for it, but we're not altogether sure. Certainly by the end of Cuffey's um, government, um, he had decided on two states coexisting, probably the first time this was ever suggested really, or proposed in the Caribbean. However, Van Hoogenheim's response to Coffey is that he has to seek the consent of his employers in Holland. It is a clever ploy by the governor. He intends to keep Coffey in negotiations to buy time while he fortifies his position at Dagorad and awaits further support from abroad. As Van Hoogenheim says in his journal, I think personally that it is of great necessity that we make good use of correspondence in our dismal situation, the more so because the enemies themselves started it. However one sees it, we can never be at a disadvantage. When nothing is promised the rebels, we enjoy great benefit and advantage. Were it no more use than to win time, that alone would be my aim. Indeed. For the rest of April, a stalemate ensues as Coffey decides to trust the good fate of the governor. He, however, recognizes the need to reduce the threat of counterattacks from neighboring Dutch colonies. He therefore dispatches 200 men to Demerara to incite the captive Africans there to revolt. Without knowledge of the Indian trails, however, the men never reach and are forced to return. Acre's decision to attack Dagorad in defiance of Kofi is one of the first clear indications that disunity has now crept into the leadership of the rebellion. Acre, most likely, is frustrated over Kofi's apparent indecision to attack the last Dutch position on the coast at St. Andrews. Coffey's authority is now openly challenged. Coffey faces the daunting task of keeping the revolutionaries united. The highly mixed African population poses a constant problem. Inherent difficulties soon spring to the fore. The blacks split either into the Akan group from the African Gold Coast or the Congo group from Central Africa. They also split into those who were born in the colony, the Creoles, and those who recently arrived from Africa. On May 13th, the largest battle of the 1763 rebellion takes place. The revolutionaries launch a massive attack with over 2,000 men to overrun Dagorad. Coffee is by now convinced that the Dutch governor has no interest in a compromise but intends instead to crush the rebellion. Coffey realizes his only option is to drive the Dutch out of Dagorad. But the Dutch enjoy a stroke of good timing. Just 10 days earlier, on May the 3rd, two ships from St. Eustatius, armed with cannons and transporting over 150 soldiers, had dropped anchor off Dagorad. The revolutionaries attacked the plantation from three sides. With little gunpowder in their possession, the attackers have only a few guns. They rely mostly on swords, spears, and agricultural implements. Part of Coffee's plan, therefore, is to capture one of the Dutch ships. The attackers gain an initial advantage. But the powerful artillery fire from the ships soon wreaked havoc among them. 
But the revolutionaries fight on for five hours, launching repeated waves of attack. The superior firepower eventually breaks the spirit of Coffee's army, and they are forced to retreat. They lose about 100 fighters. The Dutch lose only 10 soldiers.